So, um, well, it's great to uh, be here. So, um, as I said, um, I work in mathematical biology. So, um, I never actually realised this subject existed until I went to university. Um, but it's actually quite a big field. So, um, so I'm partly going to talk about how mathematics meets um, biology. But I'm also going to talk about how biology meets mathematics because it's a two-way street. This, mathematics has helped biology, but the, the other way is true as well. So biology has really helped mathematics. Um, and so what I want to do today is kind of give you an idea about how these two subjects actually can work together because it's not two subjects you usually think go hand in hand. So, um, so let me tell you what biology is first of all. So, I mean, you've probably all studied it in, in school. Maybe you're still studying biology now. So biology is the science of all living things. And here's a picture just to kind of give you an idea of the scope. So from, from the landscape, we're talking the sea, the trees, to uh, us as individuals, ourselves, our genes. Very, very complex system. There's, um, in fact, um, we understand actually quite a lot about it, about it nowadays. Um, they often say that the 20th century was the century for physics when so much discovery for physics was made. Well, they're, they're now saying that 21st century will be the century for biology because with the um, sequencing of the human genome, we know so much more about what is going on in biology and what is going on in our living systems. So how does math come in there? Well, Tom Stoppard, who's a, a playwright, he um, uh, made a, a quote in one of his plays, Arcadia, and he said, if there's an equation for a curve like a bell, there must be an equation for one like a bluebell. And if a bluebell, why not a rose? Do we believe that nature is written in numbers? So even Tom Stoppard, who's a playwright, was actually thinking there might be a connection between mathematics and biology. And he's not the first to do that. There's many other um, people in, in science, but also in, in literature, that have, have made that same thought and that same connection. So uh, what good is mathematics? How is it going to help us? Like, I mean, how on earth do I bring these two quite different subjects together? Well, what mathematics is very good at is giving us a disciplined way of thinking about things. So we can think about numbers, we can think about shapes, and we can think about patterns. Mathematics is very good at doing all of these things, and we can think about all of these things, not just in time, but also in space. And so um, by using mathematics to rigorously kind of tie these things down, we are hopefully going to be able to say something about biology as well. So why hasn't this been done sooner? The, the subject has really only um, been going since probably the last 50 or 60 years as, as something that, that there's, where there's a lot of researchers working in. So part of, the, part of that is because it's only recently that we've had enough understanding of the, the biological systems that we're interested in. Uh, but also, we've only just developed enough mathematical tools to be able to say something about those biological systems. We've now got the tools, but now we've got the challenge of trying to communicate with one another. And that's difficult, because sometimes we even have the same word for completely different things. And so we have to try and understand each other before we can even work together. And that's part of my job. Is So I spend a lot of time talking to biologists, and we try and understand each other so that I can take their questions and try to formalise them in my language, my language of mathematics, and then hopefully try and give them some results. And then they have to take my results and try and figure out what that means to them. So it's always about the communication. So where do we start? Well, I could put in all the complexity. So this is actually, this big mess here, is um, a picture of all the genes in an immune cell. So there's 749 of them. They're all connected in various ways, very complex. Okay, I could put all that complexity in, and I could write down an equation for each gene and how it relates to every other gene. Okay, I could put it in a computer, and I can get some output. Well, do I really want to do that? Does that really going to tell me anything? Um, I mean, it's recreating the biological system, but is that going to be enough? Well, we don't really want to do that. We want to kind of get a bit more creative. Okay? We want to, to kind of do something a bit more simpler than this. Okay? And here's a great example where physicists actually took the same approach and went simpler. Okay, so let's think about our solar system. So there's nine planets and various moons in our solar system. Um, so in total, it's about 20 bodies. 
they've each got three degrees of freedom, so your three spatial directions. Okay. And you need two equations uh, for each of these objects. So that's 120 equations. Okay. That's a lot of equations you've got to solve. Okay. It's still about a sixth of the ones uh, for the immune cell that I just described, but it's still a lot of equations. Well, I mean, did, did they solve all those equations to put a, um, the man on the moon or put a satellite in space? And the answer is no, they didn't. Okay. They used approximations and various techniques to solve simpler problems. Okay. And that's exactly the approach we take for biology as well. So what I'm going to do is take you through some various examples from biology where we take a slightly simplified view of the problem, but it actually tells us a lot about the question we want to understand. So let's start off with an example of mathematical biology from way back in history. So from the 17th century, so this is actually the time of the, the plague. So the plague is going on in, in, uh, in the UK at this time. So the, the the, the problems for physicians are huge at this time. And understanding about the human body is still pretty poor. Okay. So, um, so the question that I pose at this point is, does blood, blood circulate? Okay. This may seem a really silly question because you think, well, yes, of course it does. Well, at the time, they didn't think this was the case. Okay. What they thought was that the, um, that the arteries... They were all about cooling your body. Your heart generated heat and your arteries were all about cooling your body down. And they thought the veins, well, they were kind of disposing waste and that these two systems were completely disconnected and had nothing to do with one another. So at the time, they thought that the, body, the, the artery system was a bit like this. We had some source, which was basically through your food. It got turned into blood. It got pumped through the heart and then sort of came out the other end. And that was kind of their view of how our blood works through the body. Okay. And it may seem like completely strange now to even think this, but at the time, that was what everyone thought. So William Harvey came along. Uh, so he was a physician. He was actually a physician uh, to two of the kings at the time, James I and Charles I. So he was hugely important in his time. And he really turned around at thinking about how the human body works. And um, in his book that he wrote um, about the circulation, the motion of the heart and the, and the blood, he proposed that, in fact, this idea was wrong and that, in fact, the blood circulated around the body. So it came in, the heart pumped it back out, and it went through the body. And that these two systems of artery and veins were actually connected. Okay. This was, I mean, this was really controversial at the time. I mean, everyone thought this, and it was like, how can this be true? And the way he went about showing that this one just couldn't be possible was he used a bit of mathematics. So let's, let's see the mathematics that he used. Okay. What he did know was that um, in a single heartbeat, uh, sorry, 16 heartbeats, in fact, you can pump one gallon of blood. So the heart can push through one gallon of blood in 16 beats. He knew that. We're talking about an average human here. So he knew that um, from, from his experiments that he was doing at the time. Um, he knew that on average we could say, right, there's 50 beats a minute. Okay. So your heart beats 50 times a minute. So he was deliberately taking a lower estimate because he wanted to get the lowest possible number out here. And, and you'll see why he wanted to go for a low number in a minute. So, okay, so we've got how, many, how much blood go, gets pushed through through each beat, how many beats we have a minute, we know how many minutes are in an hour, we multiply all those together, and we find that we get 190 gallons of blood are pushed through the heart per hour. Okay. And um, so in fact, most humans actually beat more than 50 beats a minute, only if you're a good athlete, which I'm, I'm not, would you have, have that kind of uh, uh, heart rate. So, so, um, so this is actually probably a lot lower than the actual figure. But this is a huge number, 190 gallons, that's huge, of, of blood goes through the heart per hour. Okay. And so what he concluded is there's no way that this can be going on, because your body doesn't contain that. Your body contains um, just over a gallon of, of blood. Okay. So if this much, if 190 gallons was going through you in an hour and ending up somewhere, where is it going? It just wasn't, it just, it just wasn't possible. So he ruled out this idea. So just some very simple mathematics actually gave Harvey the conclusion that blood must circulate. And he then did a bunch of experiments to, to actually show this was indeed what was happening. 
Um, so this is just a very simple example of math. So let's keep on working with this idea, just with simple, simple, simple math and see where we can go. 